Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the bridge. Before we do anything else, it's probably pretty important for me to wish all the dads up there a happy Father's Day. So, happy Father's Day, everyone that is a father and a dad. And we can let them know how much we appreciate our dads. And I have someone else up here with me today that is a very, very special person. And if you don't know her yet, you need to make a point to get to know her. This is Grace Phelps, and uh, she is a huge blessing. And I have been blessed to have been her religion teacher since she is, was in kindergarten, and she is going into fourth grade, right, this coming year. And uh, you heard her story if you were here about three or four weeks ago. Um, Grace's parents, her dad is Matt, who's our drummer, and mom, Shauna. And Matt and Shauna were two of the first three people to be baptized at the bridge. And maybe about three or four weeks ago, Grace saw me uh, at school and said, hey, I have something really important to tell you. I want to get baptized. So we kind of talked through aspects of that, and then there were some other students there, and they said, well, I think I want to be baptized too. And I said, well, why, why are you baptized? And Grace said, well, you're baptized when Jesus saves you, and you want everyone to know that. So at the end of church today, after the sermon, we're going to go outside into the courtyard. And if you don't want to go outside, it also can be televised here. Pretty cool thing we've got going on. And uh, anyway, but Grace and also Leanne, and Leanne, we're going to hear from her a little bit later, are going to be baptized at the end of church today. And we are going to present Grace with this uh, children's Bible called the Gospel Story Bible. And Grace this verse is something that we just want to encourage you with and continually remind you of. And it's Psalm 18.2, which says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. And Grace, we are very, very proud of you and can't wait to see your baptism in just a little bit. Thank you. Right. And as we prepare to worship the Lord today, the very first song that we're going to sing is called Angel Armies or Whom Shall I Fear? And one of the verses of the song or the chorus of the song says, I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. So it's our hope that as we sing this song that God will just so powerfully through the Holy Spirit remind us that he is by our side and uh, he's the God of angel armies. Please stand as we sing. You hear me when I you are my morning song Though darkness fills the night It cannot hide the light Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy Underneath my feet You are my sword and shield Though troubles linger still whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. strength is in your name for you alone can say you will deliver me yours is the victory whom shall I be whom shall I be I know who goes before me I know who stands behind the God of is always by my side the one who reigns forever he is a friend 
friend of mine, the God of angel armies, is always by my side, and nothing formed against me shall stand. You hold the whole world in your hands. I'm holding on to your promises. You are faithful. You are faithful, you are faithful. I know who goes before me, I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always my Amen. And isn't that a reassuring thought? Uh, the God of angel armies is always by our side. And um, I want to share with you scripture from Proverbs, Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no vision, people cast off restraint. But blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. And I love that scripture as we get ready to sing, Be Thou My Vision. Um, we see a lot of things day to day in our lives, don't we? And it's not what you see, but it's how you interpret them. And uh, my wife likes to use the term a lot, seeing things through Jesus' eyes, right? And that's what this song is about. It asks uh, uh, our Lord and God to, to be our vision, to be the Lord of our heart. And uh, that's what we want to sing about this morning. Lift it up to it. Our 
Our God is an awesome God, and one of the awesome things He does for us is He gives us children, correct? And we're going to take this uh, uh, opportunity to dismiss all of our kids, uh, birth through fifth grade, to Children's Church and uh, our helpers. And as we like to do every week, we also like to take this opportunity to raise them up in prayer as they go to hear God's Word. Uh, So join me real quick as we pray for our kids. Father God, we are so thankful Uh, as we have a day-to-day to to celebrate fathers. uh, But Lord, right now we think about, as fathers and mothers, these kids that you've blessed these families with, that you've blessed this church body with, Lord. And uh, we take our responsibility to uh, sow the seeds of your word in their hearts very seriously. And I just lift them up to you now. I lift up the helpers and the teachers, Lord, and ask that you give them a great time of fellowship, uh, teaching and learning with these kids. Uh, Again, they are so precious to us, and we just ask for your blessings uh, on all of them and all of us as we continue our worship today. We ask all of these things in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. He became sin who do no sin that we might become his righteousness he humbled himself and carried the cross love so amazing love so amazing Jesus Messiah name above all
of all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the ransom for sinners, the ransom from heaven. Let's pray. Oh, Father, Lord, you are our great Father, the Almighty and Heavenly One, Lord. And today we thank you, Lord. We thank you for being our great Father, the one that loves us so much, so much that you sent Jesus for us, Lord. Uh, Lord, I just want to thank you for all the fathers out here that you lead to be good fathers to raise their families well. Lord, we thank you for all them. We thank you for the blessings of each and every day that you give us, and may we not take advantage of that, Lord. May we just give all the glory to you. So, Lord, with that we ask, whatever's in our hearts today, Lord, may you uh, take that from us as you did our sin. We love you, we need you, and we trust you. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And uh, I told you we'd be able to hear from Leanne a little bit later, and we're going to have an opportunity to do that at this time. And uh, just want to, before she shares, emphasize, just like I did, if you've not had an opportunity to get to know Grace, if you've not had an opportunity to get to know Leanne, these are two people that will just richly bless your lives and they have an infectious love for God and an excitement for what God's doing in their lives. So she's going to share a little bit with us. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll make this uh, brief. Uh, uh, my husband and I have been trying to conceive for about three years. Uh, last summer, I started fertility treatments <clears throat> and a search for answers, for many answers. My fertility calls me to ask questions like, what kind of person am I? What have I done that God would not give me a child? How am I living my life? <clears throat> How would I live my life if I had a child? How does God want me to live my life? So I started searching, reading a Bible in a year a friend loaned me, I reading books by uh, Max Licato, and praying, searching for God. My moment of surrender came after months of praying and fertility treatments with no success. It happened one evening as I was reading on my couch home alone. As I was reading, the love of God overwhelmed me. Love for his son, Jesus. Love for humanity. And love for me. So I prayed, God, I love you. I know you have a plan for me. I know I've pleaded with you to be a mother, but I want to live my life for you. Whatever your plan is for me, if I am to be a mother or remain childless, it is okay. Whatever plan you have for me is the one I want. As I sat there crying and praying, my despair and burden was lifted from my heart. I felt physically lighter. I believe at that moment, for the first time in my life, I chose God over myself. Hmm. Looking back, I realized that not only I, <clears throat> did I surrender my infertility to God, but I also surrendered my barren and fruitless life. I now have faith that my God has a plan for me. I have hope to see him one day in our eternal home. 
and I have the love of a Heavenly Father that I am only beginning to understand. Thank you. Amen. And Leanne, um, if you come back for just a second, we want to uh, bless you also with the Bible and uh, to commemorate your baptism. And uh, <laughs> um, the verse that was selected for you, um, and after you got to hear some of her story, and we'll talk a little more about that, but it's Psalm 121, 1 and 2, and the Holy Spirit um, got you to this point, I think, uh, based on what you just shared. And this verse says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And I uh, just want to bless you with this, and we can't wait for your baptism as well. So thank you, Leanne, and thank you for sharing. Um, God is constantly at work and constantly doing abundantly more than all we could ever ask or imagine and he prompts us in a variety of different ways but one of the things that happens is that God speaks most powerfully not through our pleasures but through our pain and God speaks in our pain to give us hope and strength in the midst of it. So you heard from Leanne, she surrendered her will and her infertility to God, and what happened at that moment was God enveloped her with his love and his hope and his strength and his purpose and his plan. We've all probably been alive long enough to realize we don't get everything we want in this life. We are not citizens of this earth. We are citizens of heaven. And there is a place that God is preparing for those who place their faith and trust in Jesus that is far beyond our wildest dreams. Paul really, really, really wants believers in this small town in Colossae to get that. That there is something that is bigger and better than what we see with the naked eye. That we are those who live by faith and not by sight. Now, you may hear that and say, yes, 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 I know, but so often I live by sight. And I do that. So then the question becomes, is there hope? If I'm living by sight so often and I'm supposed to live by faith, where's my hope? Your hope comes in going to the one who gives you the gift of faith. So each time that I fall into the trap of living by sight and not by faith, I go back to God who gives faith and say, God, I don't know what's wrong with me. Maybe I leak. Maybe I've got problems, I do have problems, and, I do. and so do you. So we go to God and say, God, I need power. I need a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit. I need a fresh word from you. I can't make it without you. You know what happens when I do that? God kind of, in some form or fashion, says or communicates something like, Yes, you're right. You can't make it without me. But it's my grace that has brought you to that realization, and I will give you the gift of faith. We celebrate Father's Day today. Jesus said one time that you, though you are evil, you earthly fathers know how to give good gifts to your children. And you're evil, but you know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more then will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask? The Gospel of Luke, Jesus says, 
that that good gift that the Father wants to give to his children is the gift of the Holy Spirit. What's the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit is God with us in the here and now. Jesus ascended into heaven. He's sitting right beside God the Father on the throne, and he's not just twiddling his thumbs. He's doing something rather amazing. He's praying for us that our faith may grow, that we may grow in our knowledge of God's will, that we may grow in our understanding of spiritual wisdom, and that we may grow in our power of his glorious might so those are things that paul prays for a group of believers around 60 a.d quite some time ago the crazy thing though about the bible is that what was relevant in 60 a.d is just as relevant in alton illinois in 2014 so colossians 1 starting with verse 9 let's read this together and this is a prayer that Paul prays. He says, and so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Please pray with me. God, you've already done so much here in this service. But we need more We need more of your truth to penetrate our hearts. So Lord, we know you're good. We know you're faithful. And Lord, we ask that you would bring to mind things we so often forget. We are through faith in your son. We are yours. We've been qualified by you. We've been delivered from the domain of darkness into your light. God, may these truths not be things we only know in our head. May they be things that penetrate our hearts and transform our lives. And God, I pray that you may speak boldly and powerfully through me. That you would hide me behind your cross and that Jesus would be high and lifted up continually in this place as we continue to worship him. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the most profound blessings of being a pastor is I get an opportunity to hear people's stories. And I have never in my life heard two stories that are exactly the same. And in every single story that I hear, God is radically at work. Now, some of you may say, wait a second, if you heard my story, I would maybe tell you I don't think God works. And maybe you are struggling with something like that. But the fact that you're acknowledging that you're not sure God works, yet you're here, is proof that God is working. Okay, why would you be here? There is something that is at work when God gets a hold of somebody that is undeniable. And Paul enters into this prayer and says, I'm going to pray for believers in such a way that the undeniability of their faith grows 
and so transforms everything about them that they'll never, ever be the same. Um, I'm going to not contradict what I said last week, but I'm going to, okay, watch this wording. We talked about Matt and Shauna and Grace earlier, and we heard last week that we often should thank God for people, and I'm going to thank God for them, but I am going to brag on Jesus about the way that I see God mightily at work in their lives. Today is Father's Day, and I've had enough conversations with Matt to know that Matt and Shauna both, their deepest, deepest desire is to see grace walk with the Lord. To know, first of all, we know the love Jesus has for us, and then secondly, we begin to love him back. We love him because he first loved us. One of the most profound, powerful things that we as parents can do for our children is pray for them. I was talking with another brother over coffee, um, and, and he shared that as he looks at this passage of Scripture, he goes, wow, what an incredible prayer to pray for children. That we would grow in knowledge of God's will. That we would be empowered by his glorious might what better prayer to pray than that our children may walk with God in a way that's pleasing to him and we get to witness that with grace and the faithfulness of God on all of the amazing things that he does but it does place a significant responsibility on us as parents as grandparents, as other family, and as church family. I often say that, um, well, there's a story that I heard uh, relatively recently about a dad who did not do well with his life, and he had two sons, and one son turned out just like his dad, and the other one was the total opposite of his dad. And they were both asked, why did you turn out the way that you did? And their response was both the same. Well, have you met my dad? How else should I turn out? One saw the ugliness in the dad and looked for something different. The other saw the ugliness in the dad and thought, well, I guess I'm supposed to be just like him. Paul prays that we may know what our heavenly Father is like. And when we begin to be gripped by who our heavenly Father is, we want to imitate Him. We want to walk with Him. We want to look like Him. We want to act like Him. We want to behave like Him. So what does Paul pray Actually, before we even go there, um, I'm just curious with a, okay, you don't even have to raise your hand high, and you don't have to raise your hand, but I'm going to ask this question, and if you want to raise your hand, you can. Have you ever wondered, does prayer make a difference? Or have you ever been at a place, all right, we've got a couple honest people in the back, and it's okay, you don't have to raise your hand, all right, but just think that through. Have you ever wondered, does prayer make a difference? Second question, have you ever felt like your prayers aren't getting any higher than the ceiling? All right. Third question, have you ever thought, okay, God, I have no idea what I'm doing in praying here, but I've kind of picked up some things. I've heard that it's a good idea to bow your head, close your eyes, fold your hands. Maybe you hear me better when I do that. And I've also heard that it's good to pray in Jesus' name at the end, so I'm going to tack that on at the end. And it's good to thank you. So, so, in other words, you're thinking God will hear you based upon what kind of formula that you articulate your words to him. 
And that if you maybe don't get the prayer you're answering for, that maybe you got the formula wrong, or maybe you got the magic word incorrect. And none of that is true. Prayer always makes a difference. Your prayers always get higher than the ceiling. And there are no magic words that cause God to hear you better than others. You want proof of that? Those of you who are parents, remember when your children were very small and cried? Did you respond to them when they cried on a certain pitch or in a certain way or for a certain length of time? Or did you respond to them because they were yours and they needed something? So often prayer is a cry out to God and a confidence. God hears, God cares, God responds, God moves as a result of me just saying, I need help. Now there is a certain kind of thing that God does not respond to, and he does respond, but he doesn't respond in the way we want him to. Someone who says, I don't really need you actually, God. I think I got this thing made. And God responds by saying, okay, let's see how it goes for you. And then you hit a wall, or you hit rock bottom, or you hit a bottom. And God wants us all to get to the end of ourselves. And when we're at the end of ourselves and say, God, if it's not for you, if you don't come through here, I've tried this whole deal and I don't have the owner's manual because I didn't create myself. You created me. And I need you because you're the only person who knows exactly how I'm programmed to work. And I need you. Another very cool story that I believe is, is true and I believe God does things like this still today is about a missionary that was traveling to get medical supplies and he was on the road and he was by himself. He was by himself. And as he was by himself, he camped out that night and he had a lot of money and a lot of medical supplies with him. And a group of guys saw him and thought, you know what, piece of cake. The guy's sleeping and we think he's rich. We're going to attack him. Well, it was in the middle of the night in whatever country he was in. It was in the middle of the day back in America. And there were four believers that had just gotten onto a golf course. And they're ready to play a game of golf. And right before they start playing the game of golf, one of these guys says, hey, our buddy that we pray for that's a missionary in this country, I don't know what's going on, but something's wrong, and we need to pray for him. So the other guy says, you know what? I just had the exact same feeling. I think we need to leave the golf course. I think we need to round up everybody that we can and go to church and pray for this man right now, right away. So they go off the golf course, and they round up some people, and they intercede for this man. This man, the men that are about to attack him, don't attack that night. And the next day, they go to him and say, what God do you worship? The man says, well, it's nice, you know, very easy to share the gospel whenever someone asks, what God do you worship? And he smiles and says, well, I worship the creator and the one who sent his only son, Jesus, to save us and forgive us for our sins. And these men say, we want to worship him too. What do we have to do? Now, this was not an easy mission field. So the guy looks and says, what in the world happened? And said, so we were going to attack you and rob you last night. And we saw 11 shining men surrounding you. And we figured we better not do anything. And then we figured if that's happening and that's going on, then we want to know more about this God. And they became believers. Fast forward about six months, this missionary is back at his home church and shares this story. The golfers stand up and say, um, hold on, how many people were at that prayer meeting that we rounded up? And 11 people stood up. Now, 
God does not teleport people to, okay, a foreign land. But the Bible is very clear that God commands his angels concerning his people. And there is a supernatural protection available for us that comes in a number of different ways that we cannot always explain or understand, but we don't have to deny that it's not there and that it's not real and that it doesn't happen. So as Paul is praying for these people, Paul's in a jail cell. He's under house arrest, so it might not have been as bad as a jail cell. But he's in prison, and he prays. But he's had enough encounters with God to know that when he prays, supernatural things happen. And I'm saying all that in a very long intro, and the sermon will be shorter. For you all to know that when you pray to Jesus, the God who sent his one and only son to save us, supernatural things happen. And if you're tempted to say, well, I don't see any of that stuff, can I remind you what I did at the very beginning? We live by faith and not by sight. We will not always see it our way or in our timetable, but that doesn't mean that it's not happening and that it's not working. So what's Paul pray for? First of all, he prays a certain way. He says that he hasn't stopped praying for these people. I had a, there was a guy that I knew in college, I almost said friend, but I didn't know him really well. And he really took this pray without ceasing thing seriously. And every single time that he passed you when he was walking by you in camp, on campus, he muttered something under his breath. Every single time. Everybody he passed. He never walked with anybody else, hardly. And finally, somebody asked him, why are you constantly muttering? And he smiled and said, I'm praying for people that I pass. Well, we kind of encouraged him that that was like really, really cool, but maybe he doesn't actually need to mutter (laughs) because that's kind of weird. And people think that he might be trying to communicate to people, but he was impressed upon his heart to pray for every single person that he passes. We said in the early stages of of the the bridge, um, I've shared with some folks that, you know, if, if we really want to be on mission and we still need to do this, When we go grocery shopping, we shouldn't just be shopping for food. We should be looking for people that we can pray for, that we can encourage, that we can give strength to. The reality is that someone said one time, and there's some good philosopher, and I forgot who it was, but he said, be kind. Everyone is fighting some kind of battle. How true is that? And who better to be kind than people who know the kindness of the one true God. So the next time you go grocery shopping, let's say, okay, I've got my list of food I'm going to pick up, but I'm also going to be sensitive to people that I might encounter and, and people that God might want me to encourage. So he's praying continuously for these people. How do you pray continuously for someone? They're just never really off your mind and off your heart, okay? God enlarges our hearts to cause our love for people to grow. And often God prompts us when we don't, like, we're like, well, who should I pray for? The best question to that or answer to that is, who have you been thinking about recently? Now, the default mechanism of of prayer, if you're not praying, you're often still thinking about people but instead of praying for them, you're often worried about them. You know what I've discovered about worry? It brings no joy at all. You know what I've discovered about prayer? It brings an incredible amount of joy and comfort because when you worry, you're, you can't really do anything about it anyway. When you pray, you can't really do anything about it either, but you talk to the one who can do tons of stuff about it. So each time you worry, take it to the Lord in prayer. I know it's kind of cliche, but boy, it's so true. And what's interesting is if if you consider yourself a habitual worrier and you begin to really tap into this, 
you'll become an incredible prayer warrior, all right? Because you're constantly thinking about people anyway. Just move your worries to prayer, and incredible stuff happens, takes place. What is Paul praying for these folks? He's asking them that they may be filled with the knowledge of his will. I talked to somebody else last night about what that means and what that looks like. We probably all have a couple people in our lives where we know them so well that we can complete their sentences. We know what they're about. We know their will. Paul prays that believers in this town would know God so well that they would be able to complete his sentences. How's that happen? Well, how's it happen with a good friend? You spend time with them. You communicate with them. You listen to them. You get to know their hobbies. You get to know what makes them tick. You get to learn about their family. And God's saying, I want these people to know God in such a way. And God, he's talking to God about them. God, I want them to know you so much that they're able to complete your sentences. That they know your will. They know what brings you joy and they know what brings you pain. You know what happens with real good friends? The things that bring my really good friends joy bring me joy. And the things that bring my really good friends pain bring me pain. So Paul is asking, I want these people, God, to be filled with such a knowledge of you that the things that cause you to rejoice, they rejoice about. And the things that break your heart, break their heart. It's an incredible prayer. And one way that that happens is through reading this book, okay? All of God's will is contained in this book. So we can get to know God's will better by getting to know the love letter that he's written to us. I did this last week too, but this is awesome Bible study that you guys, if you're not taking advantage of it, Tuesday morning, if you're a guy, it's an incredible time to come together and get to know God through his word with other people. And if you're a woman, Tuesday night at seven o'clock and we're walking through this book. What else does Paul pray for them? He prays that they may have all spiritual wisdom and understanding. He wants them to be filled with the Holy Spirit so that wisdom can be defined as knowing what the right thing is to do and doing the right thing. So in James chapter 1, James tells us, if any of you lack wisdom, you ever lacked wisdom before? James says, pray and God will give you wisdom without any prerequisite, okay? You ask God for wisdom, he'll give you wisdom. But you know what happens when he gives you wisdom? He does also give you the power to apply the wisdom. And sometimes I've asked God for wisdom and then I've gotten a revelation of what he wants me to do or how he wants me to act in a certain situation. And I want to like say, I, I wasn't really serious about that, God, because I don't really want to do that. When God gives us wisdom, he wants us to apply it to our lives. And what happens when we do that? We walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. I've shared this a few times too, but I taught my kids that one thing about Helfrix is Helfrix don't give up. And I told you guys a story about we lost the dogs one time and I didn't want to find them. And I said, okay, well, they'll come back when they come back. And Benny and Sophie preached back to me, Daddy, you're a Hellfrick, and Hellfricks don't give up. So we have to keep looking for Whitey and Wally, our dogs, until we find them. So yeah, that's, that's true. But what they discovered there is that there's a name that means something. And, and it's sad that, that often our, our, our names, the family name, doesn't always have the respect and regard that it used to. Well, God has a name. We're going to get to witness two people getting baptized into that name in a little bit. 
And that name carries a reputation. And the Holy Spirit comes and lives in you and dwells in you. And that means it really matters where you go and what you do and what you think about and who you support. It matters. The Bible talks about how light and darkness don't have things in common. And we're children of the light. And how do we begin to know this or discover this? It's really simple. We pray, God, I want to be able to finish your sentences. So help me know your will. And I want the things that break your heart to break mine. And you know what happens? Like we don't have to read it in a rule book if we're walking with God. The Holy Spirit goes, hey, what are you doing? Your father's not about that. Come over here. Your father's about this. Focus on this. It just happens. It's a transforming thing that takes place. To where often your life before Christ, you can look at pictures or videos or pick on social media for for a second. Stuff that sometimes people post on social media and go, I can't believe I did that. And it causes your heart to grieve. But then you go, but I don't desire that anymore crazy you know what happened means that god has taken you out of the dominion of darkness and transferred you into the kingdom of his son and your affections and your mind and your heart it changes so how does this play out it's all about the gospel we talk a lot about the gospel at the bridge that the gospel is the good news of great joy that jesus saves we got to make sure we get the gospel right. The gospel only requires two things. Faith, which God gives us, and repentance. And repentance means you turn away from your sin and you turn to your Savior, Jesus. So John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, said at the end of his life, there are two great truths that have gripped his heart He used to be a slave trader, and Jesus radically saved him. And he said, number one, I am a great sinner. And number two, Jesus is a greater Savior. Those two truths grip the heart of a genuine believer. Okay? You will never get over your sin You'll always see it because the moment you think you tackled something else, God shows you something else you haven't tackled yet. And the moment you think you've tackled one thing, then a couple weeks later, you're like, hey, wait, I thought I, I thought I, I thought I figured that out. So he shows us our sin, but then he shows us our Savior. Faith and repentance are the two things that the gospel requires. That's it. After that, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us and totally wreaks havoc on our lives in good ways and transforms our affections and our desires. And the gospel then bears fruit, which is something else that Paul prays for. He says, I want you to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, so that you will bear fruit in every good work. The gospel causes us to bear fruit in good works. This is another way that the gospel messes, you can miss it if you think, okay, now I'm a Christian, so I can't do this, and 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 then I'm a good Christian. It doesn't work that way. The way that it works as God gives you the gift of faith that leads you to see your sin and see your Savior. And once you see your Savior, you begin to fall in love with your Savior. And if you're genuinely in love with someone, it changes the way you live. And you begin to do what the one you love seeks to desire. And the fruit that it produces is good works 
So good works are not a condition of our salvation. My dad's taught me this. Happy Father's Day. Thank you, Dad. But they are a reflection of our salvation. You are not saved because of your good works. But if you are genuinely and truly saved, good works will happen. Okay? No good works, no assurance of salvation. But if you think that your good works are saving you, then you also have no assurance of salvation. Because we're not saved by our works, we're saved by grace through faith. It's a gift that Jesus gives to us. But once we've been given that gift, God gives us this incredible opportunity to steward it well and allow the Holy Spirit to fill us and free us so that good works will abound in our lives. You know what the two greatest evangelism strategies are? Anybody ever tried the whole knock on somebody's door and you don't know them at all before? And you want to talk to them about the gospel? And I'm not criticizing that because I know people who have come to Christ that way. But Jesus' two strategies for sharing the good news of great joy with people were number one, people will know you're my disciples by the love you have for one another, okay? When we love each other well, people look and go, wow, these people really like and love each other. This looks like a cool group. I'd like to hang out with these people. And God is gracing us with that here at the bridge, and it's beautiful. And secondly, by the good works that they do. Okay, we're not saved because of good works, but when people hear about good works that are from the heart, from the Holy Spirit, people stand up and take notice. And it's a beautiful thing, and Paul's praying that these believers may abound in good works. He also prays that they may have power. So most of us have cell phones, right? And cell phone batteries sometimes lose power. And what do you have to do? You have to reconnect it to the power source. God says that the power comes from God and his glorious might, his power working in us for good works. And I am about out of time. I'm going to read verses 13 and 14 and touch on it for like two minutes. So verses 13 and 14 talks about what God has done. It says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is one of the most powerful truths in the entire Bible. And we were singing one of the songs, Jesus Messiah, and, and it dawned on me that the way to apply this scripture is that God is, is looking out throughout the world and he's pointing and he's saying, you see that one over there? I'm gonna transfer them. I'm gonna pick them up by my mighty hand and move them out of darkness and transfer them into the kingdom of my beloved son. I'm going to adopt them into my family. I'm going to give them grace and faith and give them power to repent. And I'm going to move them out of the hell that they've been in and move them in to what it means to be adopted into my family. He has transferred us out. He's delivered us. He's freed us. He's redeemed us. He's paid the penalty for our sins and forgiven us of all of our sins. And he continually does that day after day, week after week, month after month. He's transferring people out of darkness 
into his life. Which begs one final question. Where are you when it comes to faith and repentance? What have you seen of God? And there's a couple different ways we could chalk this up. One way is you're just kind of checking it out. Another way is, yeah, I've heard it. Nothing new here today. I've heard it. But maybe it's kind of gotten to be an old hat and you've lost the joy of what all of this is. Or number three, God's performed a miracle and God's constantly doing that too and infused you with such a filling of the Holy Spirit that the reality of the fact that you once were in the kingdom of darkness and now you've been transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son causes you to jump up and dance and rejoice. Now, I'm not saying you have to jump up and dance and rejoice. But there's a truth that bubbles out of you. Say, yes, that's my God. He's my rescuer. He sent Jesus to save me and forgive me of all of my sins. And then you begin to walk in a way that's pleasing to him. And you bear fruit. And you know what happens when we bear fruit? Really what we're doing is we're just pointing, okay? Because you know what happens when you really bear supernatural spiritual fruit? People look at you and go, what? There's no way that joker can act that way and live that way. And you respond and go, you are absolutely 100% right. You know who makes me that way? Jesus. Jesus makes me that way. Let's pray. Father, we ask that as we prepare to witness these baptisms, that you may so fill us with your Holy Spirit that the joy that Leanne and Grace will feel may also be something that we feel and experience as well. Lord, I pray that if there are those here today that have never really seen their sin, that you would show them their sin and convict them that their sin will separate them from you, but they have a Savior that they can look to and be saved. So Lord, I pray that uh, as we prepare to sing a song called We Believe, that there would be people who would be able to sing these words and believe them from the heart for the first time today. And that those who have believed it in the past may be renewed as they sing this confession again. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Song is called We Believe. And after this song, you'll get instructions. But our baptistry is in the courtyard. And uh, I'm going to go get ready. And uh, Leanne and Grace will be getting ready. And uh, if at all possible, you're able to hand around, you will not want to miss their baptisms. Please stand as we sing. In this time of desperation, when all we know is doubt and fear, there is only one foundation. We believe, we believe. dark you help us see there is only one salvation we believe we believe we believe in God the Father we believe in Jesus Christ we believe in the Holy Spirit and he's given us new 
I tell you, there's not many things I like seeing at church more than people being baptized. Amen? And we get to witness that here in a few seconds, and that's a great thing about that song. They made that confession before they go into those waters. And so it was a great song to end with today. I'm going to go ahead and dismiss everybody through the back, to your left, and out into the courtyard uh, so that we can uh, see Leanne and Grace be baptized and uh, looking forward to that. You are dismissed. All right. If you're not at a place where you can see very well, there's some room kind of like in the center, kind of behind in that tree area. So, you know, if we want as many people to be able to actually visually see this as possible. So, uh, you know, feel free to maneuver to wherever you have to be to be able to see it. And uh, Grace, if you want to come um, at this time, and uh, as Grace is walking into the water, one other thing that is really, really neat is Grace's great-grandma Alice is here also to witness her baptism, and she was a member of when the church was 12th Street Presbyterian, and she has been a member of this church when it was 12th Street for over 50 years. And I think it's just amazing the connections that happen and take place that her great-granddaughter would be baptized in this building or near this building in this location and just the ways in which God is mightily at work in our midst. So before Grace is baptized, Grace, I want you to look out at everybody here. And I'm going to ask all of you, because we are blessed to be part of her church family, as Grace makes a public commitment to Jesus Christ today, we have an opportunity to make a public commitment to her before God. And if you make a commitment to say, I'm going to do everything within my power to pray for Grace, to teach her God's word, to walk alongside her, to encourage her as she walks with Jesus, I want you to raise your hand as high as you can at this time. And Grace, all these people are with you and for you and going to be praying for you and are super proud of you. All right. Thanks, guys. And Grace, it is a privilege and an honor for me to baptize. Well, before we do that, I have to ask one more question. And you can say it into the microphone. What is your confession today, Grace? Jesus is Savior. Jesus is Savior. All right. And Grace, it's a privilege and honor for me to baptize you, my sister in Christ, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
first people to greet her and the impact that they have had in, their, in her life as well. So, if Leanne could come now at this time. We got to hear some of Leanne's story. And uh, like I said, it's just been a huge blessing to get to know the way God is mightily at work in her life. And we're going to ask you to make the same commitment to her as well. So she makes this public commitment to follow you, to follow Jesus and commit to Jesus in baptism. If you want to make a commitment to pray for her, encourage her with the Bible, walk alongside her and be there with her and for her, I want you to raise your hand as high as you can at this time. And all these people, Leanne, are with you and for you and proud of you. And Leanne, what is your confession today? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And Leanne, based upon your confession, it is a privilege and honor for me to baptize you, my sister in Christ, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. There are very few things that are more moving than being able to witness and watch a baptism. It reminds us of the ways in which God's taken us. And in our old life is dead and we're new and alive with Christ. And if you have any questions about baptism, about faith, about repentance, we are more than happy. We're excited. We're eager to talk to you about any of those things. And uh, we call our church the bridge because we know that the cross builds a bridge that unites us to God. So I'm going to do a benediction and then we're going to sing an acapella of awesome God, right? And that'll be our close, but please receive this benediction. And now to the great God who has delivered us out of the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. May he equip us with every good work so that people will see us and glorify you. You're worthy of all honor and praise and we're grateful to be yours. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Is an awesome God he reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Sing it again louder. Our God is an awesome God he reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God.